between my eyes Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side See life's like a peach if you find the sand And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Hi there, we're live from the Prosper Show. Hey, hey. I'm here with Jeff Cohen from Seller Labs, Paul from Seller Labs, hey guys. Eric Heller from Marketplace Ignition. Guys, say hi. 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 And he's Peter Kearns. Yes, I am. So uh, we were just going to talk a little bit about kind of the state of Amazon, where it's at today, you know, where we see things going in 2017, and, you know, what we see is kind of the future. And I, when that question is typically asked of me, I really kind of, I'm bullish on Amazon. I really think that Amazon is still kind of at the beginning, even as a, you know, very uh, matured site, it still has a lot of growth. Would you agree, disagree? Yeah, I would definitely agree. I think that the marketplace, though, is changing very rapidly as brands come on and start selling themselves, uh, selling their products themselves. You know, I'd agree as well. I think uh, in line with what Peter said, I mean, when you look and you say that now Amazon's getting really uh, serious in expanding the tools for brands to police the unauthorized products that are on the site, that's good for customers and that's good for uh, the brands as well. Yeah. I also think, I'm actually, I want to broaden it and say that I'm, I'm actually bullish on marketplaces. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I heard um, here in Vegas this week, I heard uh, the CEO of Wish talk too. And he was talking about how there's a lot of marketplace growth that's already happened for affluent uh, buyers, but there's not a lot of folks that are developing features for middle America and folks that are maybe not, you know, more like the Walmart buyer. And then you suddenly say, well, wait, Walmart's developing a better marketplace for the Walmart buyer and Wish is developing them better. And so I think there's a lot of growth, I think, across all of marketplaces. Um, yeah, I was just going to chime in and say, <clears throat> listening to uh, the VP of Marketplace at Amazon, uh, now Amazon, 55% of uh, product searches are happening on Amazon, whereas only 26% are happening on search engines. Absolutely. And then, you know, Amazon is really welcoming the brands. And you're listening to all of the CEOs of all these big major retailers at another conference that happened in Vegas this week. And they're all, everyone doesn't know what they're going to do about Amazon. And I think it's, it's an amazing opportunity uh, to grow. Yeah, one of the things I saw at Prosper that I, I'd like your opinion on, they, they were talking today about sales tax and how sales tax is kind of evolving and changing. And I think it's an issue that in 2017, it's something that sellers uh, may have to kind of face, right? They haven't really had to address the sales tax issue or a lot of sellers have ignored the sales tax issue. And it was a big hot topic that was talked about here at the show. I'm curious, do you, um, do you think it's something that as a seller, if you're not already doing something with sales tax, you need to jump on? Like where? Yeah, ac absolutely. I think that sales tax, tax nexus that's created with your products into FBA. Uh, when I was at Amazon on the FBA team, we talked a lot about it with sellers. Uh, there's no real solution that Amazon offers, but it's definitely something that as state budgets continue to decline and revenues continue to decline, uh, that those states need that tax revenue. And I do think that it's something that will uh, become a topic of discussion, if not something that might actually have action on it later uh, in the future. You know, the, the interesting thing is that I'm not sure it's a state problem. You know, uh, one of the ch the single best thing that could happen to e-commerce would be that we get a national yeah, e-commerce yeah. sales tax, because the problem is that the state All problem is and right. But people <laughs> think that the funny thing is people think that e-commerce uh, wants to not pay their taxes, and I hear this all the time. Well, you know, they're just tech. It's just so complicated, right. and it's incredible. And there's there's great solutions out there for that. But at the end of the day, it's super complicated. And if you had one flat tax. And as an example with what Peter said, and I think it was really great that you brought up FBA, you know, a lot of people don't understand how commingling works. But, you know, if Jeff and I sell the same product and he ships it into the warehouse in Chicago and I ship it into Atlanta, but someone buys his product in Atlanta, 
uh, it'll ship from Atlanta and transfer my ownership to the one in Chicago. So when someone buys one to me, you, you know, I just got Nexus in Chicago that I didn't have a minute ago. And so the complexity of, of just where your product even is, even if I wanted to be an up, fine, upstanding, tax-paying individual for each state where my product is, it's really complicated. I'll just say too, as far as sales tax is concerned, is I think the states are like a little clueless as well. Um, until you actually register and get on their radar, they usually don't give you a hard time. But I've seen a lot of customers where they didn't even have Nexus in the state. They actually weren't supposed to be collecting sales tax, but for some reason they were convinced by someone to go register in the state. And then all of a sudden they have officials like hounding them, asking them to file That's in true. these states and stuff like that. So if you're worried about sales tax, you really should consult the services of a professional and make sure that you're registering in the in the states that you need to and not putting undue work on your business as well. Yeah. All right, so that's a really boring topic, right? It sucks, it's a boring topic, but it's one as sellers we all have to kind of um, deal with. You know, what was something that you kind of learned at Prosper, a presentation you saw at Prosper that kind of uh, was like, hey, that's something that uh, I really need to start thinking about with my business. And I mean, you can all talk about my presentation if you want, but you know, you might have a different one that you liked. Let's start with Paul. He keeps going late. Uh, um, I, I mean, I think, I don't know, the biggest thing that I've learned about Prosper uh, at Prosper this time, because I haven't actually been able to be in a lot of the presentations, was just the ability to connect with everybody and build relationships. So I don't really think I have like a great takeaway from Prosper. Yeah, they had um, 1,200 people here. So. Yeah, I mean, like literally, I've just been spending the last two days talking with everybody, and I think there's just some amazing people in this space. Okay, here's what I've learned. Amazon is is still a huge opportunity. I mean, we said that in the beginning, but literally like everybody I talked to, I talked to a guy yesterday, he's a engineer making $50,000 a year and um, a year ago, and now he's making $500,000 a year profit, right? And I just think that that's incredible. These people that are literally changing their lives um, and it's, it's just amazing. Like it's really hard to fail. I think that there's a huge opportunity. Yeah. I think the thing that I learned the most here is that there are a lot of changes going on in the Amazon marketplace. Uh, two days ago, Peter Ferris from Amazon announced the brand registry 2.0, which allows brand owners who have the trademark to come up and file claims against that. And people are asking me today, like, should I be worried about my business? And I don't think that's the case. I think that there's still really good opportunity um, to sell in the marketplace and all the other marketplaces that are coming up and, and being more successful. Um, but I think the thing that is what I learned the most about Prosper is you can't do it alone. Uh, and you really got to take opportunity to connect with other businesses, other thought leaders uh, who have the knowledge, the connections, um, and, and really learn from that because there's people out there that have gone through these sorts of experiences already. And um, when you get all of these people in the room all at one time, most people really want to help each other. And so yeah. I think that's the biggest thing about Prosper is that it brings that kind of connection. Yeah, it's the, it's the one thing that I, you know, the content has been phenomenal at the show. It's always very high level, but it's recorded. So you can always kind of go back and watch the content. I think what's amazing is the 1,200 people that are at the show that you can connect with and talk to yeah. and tell stories with and dissect your problems with that really makes coming to a show um, really have the value. So I'm gonna check with our host. Can we keep going? All right, are we really live on Facebook? Oh, <laughs> we'll cut that. You know, I just wanna add one more thing to that, um, just to compliment what both Jeff and Peter just said. It really, you know, the last night I was at a dinner and one of the things, you know, I go to a lot of conferences. For some reason, there's something about Prosper where you end up at dinner with six really or eight really interesting people that are from all walks that didn't know each other before dinner. and. Um, I was really struck by exactly what you just said. Last night, it happened to be that five of the people at the table were all had done y YPO or EO. And if you don't know what that is, those are organizations that help people who have uh, rapidly growing businesses get mentorship and growth. I frankly, you know, we've grown very fast. I hadn't thought about it in a long time. And what they started each talking about, what they had learned from it and how they had grown. Um, it, it, it's interesting because it's very easy to come to a show like this and I think and think, well, what's the next Amazon solution I need? But it's a really interesting thing to say, like, maybe there's something I can learn from someone in an entirely different industry who also got to 15 people 
and hit that same hurdle that I hit at 15 people and here's how they got through it. And I just want to say like getting together as a group of, of fast growing businesses, you'd be shocked by what they have in common even if they're completely unrelated. And just one last thing to say with Peter, which is Jeff Bezos is really fond of saying it's still day one. Yeah. It is totally still day one. I mean, we're 20 something years into Amazon and you know, you just listen in like every day you hear something, they bought, um, Amazon bought Souk yesterday. And you know, how long will it be before we can have our FBA product going to the Middle East? I mean, it's just incredible. Plus, plus the development of Prime Now and all those marketplaces, the, all, you, you look at that and you're a small business in Chicago and now you're a retailer or a grocery store in Chicago and you get into that program and you're on Prime Now and now your products are available in like one hour shipping in all those neighborhoods. And now Amazon, it has their FCs, but then they have all these little micro FCs all around the country. And uh, yeah, it is still day one for so many sellers. I agree. So what's the one takeaway? Uh, let's make our predictions uh, for 2017. So what's your uh, what's your prediction for 2017? And uh, it's going to be recorded, so you're going to have to. We're going to come back and verify the truth of it. What's your prediction of 2017? What's the one thing? Um, I'm going to lead with an obvious one, which is that the only thing constant at Amazon is change. And that um, we as Amazon sellers need to constantly be prepared for change. And I wrote a, a, an article uh, where I talk about FUD. FUD is uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And it's important that as Amazon sellers, we don't get we don't get afraid of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt, but that we learn from the changes that occur and we improve our businesses to withstand the change that we know is coming. So some of the change that we know is coming, right? You're going to have long-term storage fees that are going to be assessed again before the next holiday season. They're probably going to raise the rates of their fulfillment centers. They keep doing it on a regular basis. As we got into Q4 of last year, they released a bunch of new information and a bunch of uh, new policies that changed right before Q4. So let's go forward and understand that change is part of the business that we live in and that Amazon will continue to change and that we as sellers need to be prepared for it. We'll change it up. I think the, um, I'm going to go uh, a little bit broader and uh, say that I think that this is really going to be a year where there's going to be a lot of leveraging the physical footprint. You know, um, Peter was just talking about the micro FCs. And I think that uh, you're going to see a lot of talk and potentially uh, really some action and ev evolution on same day and same hour. And as we see, you know, really click and collect, same day Prime Now, you see Prime Now's in I think 43 cities as of yesterday. And I think you're going to continue to see those expansions. Our hotel this morning. We saw it come by on a cart. It's fantastic. So now you say, well, wait, can sellers be part of that? And I, I'm not sure that I do think that we'll see evolution of that this year. But what I do think we'll see is evolution of sellers rethinking about how they interact with Amazon. And hey, I have a private label brand. Maybe I want to be a first party because I want access to these things. And so I think the blend, I, I'm sorry, I think the division between first and third party is going to start to blur more and more as we see people developing new brands that they might sell first party to get access to this physical footprint. And I also think that stores that have um, big footprints are going to start to get more and more involved. You've got all of these big box stores and they're not going to wait on the sidelines forever. They're going to be involved. They're going to leverage their physical footprint. Click and collect is perfect for that. And I think, I just think e-commerce in general will grow as a, as a much bigger percent of retail. Let's shade, switch it up. Yeah, yeah, switch it up. So, um, you know, speaking, kind of bringing it back to Amazon, I think the, a thought that I've seen, and, and I'm seeing this trend a lot, is we're seeing a lot of capital come in directly to the Amazon space. So, I mean, Amazon was kind of a sleeping dragon for a while, but now uh, big venture capitalists and private equity firms are starting to realize that it's a big deal. I mean, I get emails every week from venture capitalists, private equity firms, and I know that other sellers are starting to get that. We're starting to see this access to capital and people are taking Amazon businesses seriously. So you can actually sell, you grow an Amazon business and sell it for multiples on profit and things like that a lot easier than you could before. So I think that that's gonna raise some of the sophistication um, of the sellers and of the people in the space and also the tools that are available as well. Um, I agree with both of what you guys are saying. I think that uh, what we're gonna see more of this year is, I think Walmart is gonna be a bigger part for these uh, third party sellers, the marketplaces. Um, I think eBay has a chance to, to have a bigger impact as well. Back. Absolutely. And, 
And I think that that's great for third party sellers. Uh, we need more diversity in the marketplaces. So I, I think that that will definitely start to um, take a stronger foothold. Uh, and I think that the Mariners will beat the Cubs in the World Series. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to uh, call that a wrap live from the Prosper Show.